We're getting into AO.bot now, so this will be a little bit more technical, but stick with me here. Um, if we go to our website, which is AO.bot, every time you go there, there is going to be a new randomly generated instance. This one's called Significant Olive Angler Fish. In this, it's currently it's three words that are just random. We might do something different in the future. I think it's like an adjective, an, uh, a color, and a noun. But whatever it is, it's something. Here, if I go there again, it's ready, scarlet, walrus. And every instance of AO.bot is collaborative by nature. We may change that as well in the future. Uh, but we'll always have the option for collaboration. We may make it uh, single player only by default just to save on costs and things like that. But for now, it's collaborative. I like to do this demo with another person typically, but I'm just going to do this by myself. So go ahead and pretend I'm someone else uh, if you wouldn't mind. So what I'm going to do here, here I've got my two uh, browsers. Uh, these versions here, these different uh, browser tabs are, are different uh, users, let's pretend. So let's pretend I'm in the right one, I'm in the left one, and then someone else is in the right one. What I like to do in this setting is I like to first just make a bunch of bots. These individual purple bots are game objects. And I like to ask them to help me stack this into a tower. The reason I like to do this is because it communicates instantly the natural way we can collaborate in 3D space that mimics real life. And this is a major problem that most platforms and most digital experiences have. You can't interact with someone else, as crazy as that sounds. Society has nearly perfected most of the many-to-one and one-to-many digital experiences. You know, for example, Netflix is a many-to-one where you can many, uh, or sorry, yeah, many-to-one where there's infinite selection of movies, but it's all going to one person, one device, one user, one account, right? And you can have multiple people have different accounts, but it's all just a single player experience. Or or one to many, you could make a a meta or Facebook or x.com post where you're posting some social media something that's going to many, many, many people. But you can't do those things simultaneously, collaboratively together. It's always you're posting something that many people can see, many others are posting something that you can see, but it's a single isolated experience. What we've just done by stacking bots into towers, and even by wiggling objects here, is to show that the web can be a 3D collaborative experience, and we can rethink our experiences from having to always be isolated, because sometimes, of course, you do want isolation, but we can add in collaboration, social aspects, the likes of which we haven't uh, seen before. So let me continue my demo. I'm going to go through some of the basics here. Whenever you are in AO.bot, if you click on the ground, you're going to see this little footprint image appear. And if you double click, then AO will appear here. AO is this little bot that helps you make stuff. You could think of AO like R2D2 or C3PO perhaps. And if you click and drag off of AO, you'll select somewhere on the ground. This is called this this version of data is called the grid portal. I'm going to create a bot here. A bot is a game object that can do just about anything. And um, since I have this bot here, uh, I'll interact with it in just a second. But I want you to notice something. Um, that is that, again, remember I have two different users here. One user on the left, one user on the right. The user on the left can't see the person on the right's version of AO. And the person on the right can't see the person on the left's version of AO because you have your own private AO that's working with you to make stuff with you and no one else can see it, but we do see the stuff that you make together. That's how it works by design. So now I'm going to have AO select this bot, this purple bot right here, and I'm going to open something called the sheet portal. And here, this is a simple way of, of viewing and editing data that's running in real time. And the functionality is in rows and the bots are in columns. So if I were to open up the sheet and see everything, then I would see all the bots in this instance, which I'll just delete some of them since I don't need them. Um, but if you select a bot, you can op open up the data just for that bot. And I'm going to make some changes here. 
um, at this point in the demo, if I was with someone else, I would just ask them, what color do you want it to be? And it's kind of this magic moment, so just be surprised, be impressed. So I might say green or red or yellow uh, or just put a hex code in there. And this is code. This is all raw code. So this is all case sensitive. So if you go in here and type red uppercase R-E-D, uh, oh, hey, they added that. They must have added a, a, a parsing a, a catch there to change that. But typically, it, it wouldn't work in the past. Uh, but in, in most cases, you shouldn't expect things to work if you don't function like, if you don't treat it like code. Uh, and I'll go over some of the basics there in just a little bit. Um, so here, let's take this blue bot and let's add another tag here. So if I look in the upper left of the sheet portal, I can add a new tag. And I'm going to add a tag, and a tag can be just about, well, not anything. It can be lots of things. Um, I'm going to add an on click tag, which means if someone clicks on this blue bot, something will happen. I'm going to add an, you don't have to remember all this, just watch me go so you can see what can be done. But I'm going to add an at sign to turn this on click environment into a code environment. Now it's an IDE where I can do JavaScript and other stuff. So I'll do os.toast, which is a simple toast message, and they'll say hello world. And now if I click on this blue bot, the message will appear down below uh, where it just says hello world. Now if um, I was again working with someone else, I would typically have them go into the sheet portal, and I would say you change the text to say whatever you wanted to say, and they would make it say hello, maybe they would make it say hello Craig. And then suddenly this is all working in real time. Now it says, hello, Craig. That message pops up down below. And this is amazing because we can collaborate in real time. We can code in real time. We can actually mod, change, adapt things that are made with AO.bot. And it's very easy to do that. If you are a, an actual developer with uh, any degree of prof proficiency, I don't recommend you use the sheet portal, uh, which is what this thing is called. Uh, we have a different system I recommend that you use, but it is a great place to start. And if you're wanting to simply just select and edit data, the Sheet Portal can be an amazing tool. If you want to open up the documentation and see what else can be done, whenever you're in a tag that's supported, you can always click on the Docs button right here, and that, that will take you to the Docs and take you to the, where that, that tag is, and then you can, can, can of course, uh, search the documentation and see um, all the other stuff there is to see. And we'll be adding more tags over time as we go. So let's do a few more things. Um, now I want you to see how interactive and uh, interoperable the internet can be if we stick to shared data models. What does that mean? Well, let me show you. So I'm going to go to Google. I'm just going to do this. This is You can replicate this yourself if you want to. I'm going to search for a GLTF sample model. You probably don't know what a GLTF is. Um, that's okay. A GLTF is, is a 3D asset. So you've maybe heard of a JPEG or a PNG. A GLTF is like a 3D JPEG or a 3D uh, PNG. It's basically called a mesh. It's a, three, it's a 3D asset. And I'm going to grab, I could grab any of these. Um, let's just do the Fox because I like the Fox. And I'm going to click on the GTF, GLTF file. I'm going to click on that again. And I'm going to click on this button here that says raw. And here I'm looking at a URL of all the raw uh, GLTF data. And I'm going to grab this URL. So this is right off the internet. And now I'm going to head back over here and I'm going to turn this blue bot into that fox. So I'm going to delete the color. We don't want it to be a blue fox. Well, here, I'll put it back just so you can see. Uh, and then we'll, we'll delete it later. So I'm going to add a form tag. And I'm going to say, hey, bot, you are going to have a new form now. I could say... Your, your form could be a helix, or your form could be a egg, or whatever other forms are supported, a sphere maybe. But I'm gonna set you as the form of a mesh. And that's an undefined form that you need to provide a definition to. So what's the form subtype? What kind of mesh is it gonna be? It's gonna be a GLTF. And what's the form address? Where's the GLTF located? Right here. And now I'll delete that color. Now we have a blue fox. Well, now it's a regular fox. Uh, it's a bit too small. I'm going to add a scale tag. Let's make it seven times bigger. There we go. And now I'll just copy that to the clipboard. And I'll just paste that a few times. And now we have a few more foxes here. And let's add a form animation. 
And uh, I know the animation on this fox. If it, if it didn't have this animation already defined, I couldn't do this, but it does. And now I can make it run. So let's just make that happen. And I'll make one of them a little bit bigger. Now it looks like uh, a mother or a daddy fox with two baby foxes running somewhere or something like that, perhaps. Um, and so you can begin to see how you can easily create 3D experiences using this sort of a, a framework. There's a bunch of other experiences we have created, but I wanted to show you this so that you could get a sense of how this works. It's just simple data. Now I'm gonna do two more things. I'm gonna first make a new tag here called the map portal. There are infinite ways to view data, and I'm gonna show you what I mean here in this framework. So I'm gonna pick the big fox, and I'm gonna say, I'm, uh, I'm gonna declare this, bo this fox to exist in another dimension. Why is this important? Because data has n dimensionality and you probably don't know it. When you go to Gmail or your email provider and you, you load up your email, you begin in the inbox. But the inbox isn't really where your emails are. In your, e in your, in your email client, there's thousands of emails. They're all there. And some of those emails are tagged inbox. And then when you click on inbox, it just shows the when you start there, it just shows you, you know, a, a subset of all the emails. But you don't really have an inbox. You just have a bunch of emails, and then they curate and sort what you see. Uh, likewise, um, these buttons on the web browser, as I hover over, this is the, the back button. This is the refresh. This is the home button. Those are just bots that you can click on that do things. Just like if I click on this uh, fox here, it still says, hello, Craig, because we added an on-click action. This is just... Uh, a bot, a game object that can do whatever we program it to do, and everything you use is just game objects that have been pro programmed to do what they do, and you just haven't thought of it that way before, perhaps. So I'm going to show you what I mean. I'm going to declare this fox to be somewhere else at the same time, so you can see my email example. So I'm going to add a dimension. I'm going to call it the AO. Uh, let's just call it the demo. This is the demo dimension. So I've declared a new dimension and I'm going to say true. The fox, it is now true that this fox is in the demo dimension. So up here in the URL, I'm in the grid portal um, and I'm going to, and this, this says grid portal equals home. I'm going to change home and I'm going to say grid portal equals demo and I'm going to now go to the demo dimension. And in the demo dimension, I'm now going to see a fox. In this fox, I can move it around and as you can see here, the x, y value, x, y, and z value is as well, they change, they change as I move this fox around here, and the demo dimension fox can have different x, y values than other dimensions. Uh, and so here, the fox is uh, still over here as well. So here, the fox is in this dimension, and it's also in this dimension. And if I color this fox, which I'll just select it and color it blue, then, second. There we go. Now we kind of have a bluish green fox. Or if I change it red or orange, or I guess it is already orange, uh, if I make it yellow, uh, I'm editing the data here. And if I make it bigger, I'll make it 15. It's bigger in different in, in these different dimensions. But this can be in different, in different XYZ positions. So uh, there was an error there before I figured out. That was a user error on my part. I figured out what I did wrong. But anyway, uh, now let's go see the, the fox in the map portal. So I'm going to make this fox way bigger. I'm going to set it to be 300. Uh, so it's at 30 scale. Let's zoom out. It's going to be at 300 scale, 3,000. Now it's so big that I can't even see it, and that's okay. Uh, so I'm going to head to the to the map portal. So I'm going to say and map portal equals home because I've declared this fox to also exist in the map portal. And the grid portal is ways to view data on a grid. The map portal is ways to view data on the map, as you may have guessed, and there's our fox. And so I can have data work across all dimensions and I can have data uh, visualized in all sorts of interesting ways. Whatever our ecosystem can support, we can do. And there are many ways we can take advantage of these situations. And I live over here in Grand Rapids, that's where I put my fox. And this is why we've used um, this ecosystem to make all kinds of content. But I want to show you something else here, and I want to that's that I want to show you how easy it is to 
share something that you've made. So let's say I was happy with this little experience here. I could click on AO, uh, double click to make AO appear and then click on it and I'm gonna click share and then click download. And if I download that, it's gonna generate this file called a .aux file. And this is just JSON, if you know what JSON is. Uh, but I can go to a new instance of AO.bot and I can just drag my JSON file right in and there we are and it is as simple as that and if you want to upload assets you can literally just drag it drag it in it's drag and drop right um, so that is an amazing way to quickly create and share experiences now there are also ways to publish experiences um, I won't go into the into all of the intricacies of publishing here um, but if you want to publish experiences currently we have publishing restricted to only those we give permission to in the future, this will be more of an open framework that just about anyone can use as long as they're behaving decently uh, to publish uh, biblical content. Uh, but for now, uh, if you want to join, join the Discord community, give me your email. We'll add you to the list, and then you can begin publishing and testing this. We have a, an email list that you have to be on. How it works is you'll have to go to auth.ao.bot, and then from there, you can click... Uh, log in, it'll ask you to enter your email, it will email you a code, and then once you put that code in, you're logged in and you can start publishing. But I've already done that, so I'm published already, so I'm going to hit share, and when you click share, suddenly um, it gives a random UUID here, which is a, a unique, uh, universally unique identifier, but I'm just going to delete this, and I'm going to say test publish is what I'm going to call this, test publish 5. And so now I'm going to publish this experience. And let's pretend I made something amazing that I wanted to share with my friends, family, church, community, or whatever. And now it's uploading that to our back end. It has copied that URL to the clipboard. So now if I go to a new URL and paste that in, it's going to say ao.bot forward slash AB stands for app bundle equals. And then it has the name of it, test publish five. And now it's going to launch what I made in a randomly new generated instance and suddenly there we are. So this is huge because if you know anything about publishing content, the app cycle, uh, if you want to publish an app through the app store, can take weeks, months, and you have to be approved, you have to meet their guidelines. But here I can publish two, three, four, seventy 70 uh, app bundles in a single day if I wanted to. And I have in fact even worked with second graders. And at one point I taught, I taught a, a class of second graders how to make content in this system and published it. And those second graders published more apps than most developers will ever publish in their entire life. So it's a very powerful framework, very casual, very easy to work with. Um, I will go in, into in-depth publishing later. This is just a general overview, but I hope this has been helpful and helpful uh, in a way of seeing what can be done. And I hope that you have a new appreciation now that if I go to our example projects page in Notion here, so here I am in the example projects page, and here if you go to the spreadsheet, I'll check out the Bible World experience because that's a good one. Um, one second. There, so I'm here, I clicked on the Bible World experience, and then here it's loading over here. And then now we've loaded up this demo experience we've made called the Land Between. Uh, in partnership with our good friends over at Biblical Backgrounds. And here we have a web-based experience that I narrate. That is a nice demo experience of the, of the kinds of biblical content that could be made uh, using this framework. And what's fun about this is that whenever the narration is, uh, is paused, uh, you can actually explore it. Um, and I'll skip ahead to a point where I can explore here just so you can see that. So here I'm at a point in the experience where I can explore, and I've got the map portal here and I can watch the, uh, the trade routes between Egypt and Aram and be begin to get a sense of how God placed Israel in a specific country and geological context that, that had them in a place of unique opportunity to either be the gateway of trade for the world or to be eventually crushed between warring empires as they are uh, disobedient to God. And, and just it just shows the context in such a unique way. But, but you've seen the basic building blocks of how we got here. We have 3D GLTF assets. Uh, these are just game objects that can move. We've added animations to some of them. Um, and we've got ships moving about and, and all that sort of stuff. 
So there's all sorts of opportunities there uh, for creating new content. So uh, that is our guide into AO.bot. Uh, I want to go into some of the advanced stuff briefly just so you can see what else can be done. Um, because our framework is just game objects, it's just uh, JavaScript, JSON, uh, open frameworks most developers at least have a, a cursory understanding of, AI is very good at creating experiences uh, in three-dimensional space uh, for this framework. And so you can incorporate AI, anything that you can webhook to, anything that you can network to, anything that you can run locally. There's all sorts of ways that you can make that a part of this experience. And that could be API driven, that could be all sorts of stuff, but it is possible. Uh, one thing I'm very passionate uh, about is making content that is very easy and accessible uh, and cheap to create and can be scaled up and eventually made uh, so easy to create that someone with no experience could do it. And so here, this is just a simple prototype here in the spreadsheet, um, but here we have uh, Paper Mario here, which is just a, uh, this, is a, this is a bunch of 2D images. You can think of it like a sprite sheet. So here, imagine a sprite sheet is kind of like a flip book. If you remember flip books from grade school, it's just a bunch of pictures similar to a movie, how a movie is just pictures moving fast. This is literally just 2D images that can move fast. And AI is, uh, that, is, that is being programmed to move in different directions as the character moves. And so AI is getting really good at making 2D assets. AI is not there for making 3D assets yet, uh, but I'm sure they will be in the future. But for now, 2D assets are amazing. And if we can just have AI create what's called sprite sheets, suddenly we can create tons of content uh, for free uh, or for almost free. That day is not upon us yet. I have not found any AI that can reliably create high quality sprite sheets yet, but I'm sure that day will come soon. And at that point in time, uh, we're going to have all sorts of opportunities to create new content. So the challenge then becomes not what can we do, because we can do just about anything. The challenge becomes what should be done. How do we keep God and his word at the center of what we're doing and not make this about us? How do we imagine 2D or 3D experiences that can be uh, enjoyed in ways that are uh, that are made for building us up and not for simply distracting or entertaining. I should also show as well that this is not just a 3D environment. You can make uh, 2D content here as well. Uh, Preact, JSX, HTML, CSS, all of those things work well. Here is a simple Preact uh, tank demo. Here I'm using a WASD to control this tank uh, and have it fly around the screen. This is just a simple uh, Preact demo. Or I could do, let me see here. Here I've launched the community coaster experience. We had an image here that we need to get re-added, so ignore that. But basically this is like a Jackbox kind of, uh, Jackbox.tv kind of experience where everyone who joins is, everyone is, who joins is given a random emoji. And so you can see I've got three users here. And the one in the middle is kind of leading the experience. This is designed to be a, uh, a community conversation uh, piece where people can add words and comments and raise hands um, as you listen to a sermon or something like that. This was just a simple prototype. There's all sorts of other ways things could be done, uh, but there's a lot of possibilities for making 2D content. And of course, we have a, a whole Bible. We have to talk about that. Here we have an early demo experience of our community Bible where, again, uh, pretend that these different browser tabs are different users. Uh, I have shared presence in the scriptures themselves. I can click on a verse and it's highlighted for someone else. Uh, I can go to maybe a different book. I'll go to 1 Kings here. And over here, if I open up my view of the books of the Bible, I can see, oh, hey, there's someone hanging out in 1 Kings. And if I want to, I can follow uh, the person who's in 1 Kings. And now as they move through the Bible, I will follow them through the Bible. Oh, I was just talking for a second. I don't even know what I just said, and I can't go back and check. I better, I better repeat that. Uh, what I was just saying was, uh, I didn't notice I wasn't recording. <laughs> Whoops. I was just saying that there are different translations we can have with shared presence. So here, if I'm in uh, this translation here, I can follow someone else through the Bible here. So if I want to uh, follow the person who's over here, uh, I can do that. 
So here the person on the left is following the person on the right, and as they go through the Bible, uh, they are just joining them wherever they go. So in this case, um, this is a wonderful tool because you can follow someone through the Bible or you can be led through the Bible. And one person can be in English, another person can be in Spanish. Uh, and as our API grows to support more Bible translations, we'll add those in as well. So there's all sorts of ways that we can create both 2D and 3D content. And I won't even demonstrate it here and now, but all of this is designed to interoperate because the beauty of using an open ecosystem that uses simple open standards is I can make an experience that if I click on this verse in Second Chronicles, it activates some other experience on the world map or activates some other experience in the 3D Bible. So you could be in this version of the Bible, I could be in a 3D Bible, we could have a, a map on the table and we could click on the word Haran in Genesis and see it all pan and tilt and zoom in. All those things are possible. So the sky is the limit. It really is just up to us to up, <laughs> I can't talk. It really is just up to us to figure out how to make use of these tools. I hope this has been a helpful overview and I'll see you in the next one.